Oh, 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 how wonderful. John, I've got a letter from my brother Percy down at Nettlebed. Oh, what of it, Mary, my dear? I hope he's well. Yes, yes, he says everything in his parish is going very nicely. But he recalls that next weekend is our anniversary. And he suggests that we go down to stay with him at the vicarage for the weekend. Oh, and uh, you rather like the idea. Oh, yes. We could go to church on a Sunday at St. Anne's, where we were married just a year ago. Oh, John, dear, do say yes. <laughs> Very well, my dear. If I can arrange it, I agree. And Percy also extends an invitation to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. John, dear, do you think you can persuade him to accept? Wouldn't that be quite splendid? Present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tragedy at Nettlebed. I had been married at Little Bit Church in the parish of her brother, the Reverend Percy Phelps. She'd now been Mrs. Watson for a year, and the most happy year it had been. My only regret during all that time was that I'd been forced to leave Sherlock Holmes alone in the rooms at 221B Baker Street. Of course, I never lost touch. I saw him several times a week, and was still able to give him assistance whenever he asked for it. I wondered if he wouldn't be bored by the prospect of a weekend in the country. But I was duty-bound to ask him. I knew I'd get a direct reply to my invitation. Your anniversary is it, Watson? I'm so sorry I'd forgotten. Time passes so quickly and the last year has simply flown by. It's very generous to the Reverend Phelps to extend the invitation to include me. Well, I I'll quite understand if you simply say that you don't want to go, Holmes. I shall explain that you're too busy. Although, if you can manage it, it'll make Mary very happy. Oh, I have very many happy memories of Nettlebed. It's within the area of Great Paddock, isn't it? Yes, now, that rings a bell. Let me see, where are my scrapbooks? I think this is the one. Now, let's see. If you recall, I started making up these books some years ago. They're press cuttings and many unsolved murders. I think just about six months ago, there was a most interesting case. No one ever caught a man who strangled his wife in one of the woods. I think it was Great Foxwood. And the man's name was Perryman. Yes, now let's see. Perryman. Per ah, yes, 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 here we are. Yes, I was right. Some seven months back, Arthur Perryman. Yes, that was the man's name. According to all these reports, he found out his wife had been unfaithful. One night he simply ran amuck, and following her to an assignation in Great Foxwood, he strangled her and then disappeared. The police traced him to Southampton, where he gave them the slip, and it's assumed that he managed to get out of the country. One of the few unsolved murders of the year. Interesting. Yes, I did read something about it. I know, Mary was rather upset as it occurred on the lands of Sir Rodney Trimble, who happens to be a great friend of her brother's. Well, frankly, she hasn't been back to Nettlebed since that tragedy occurred. And yet, of course, she's prepared to now. Well, well this is a very special occasion. She, she wouldn't want to turn down the Reverend's in, invitation if she wants to. It, 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 she's a god to go. <laughs> well, the whole thing is most understandable. And, of course, I shall be happy to accompany you, Watson. Well, Holmes, you will, but that's, that's excellent. We shall all be so pleased. Now, I doubt if I should be able to leave until lunchtime on Friday. Mary will probably go down a day or two earlier, so uh, can you manage the 2.30 train from Euston on Friday, Holmes? Holmes agreed to the arrangement, and Mary was delighted. She sent a telegram to her brother, saying she'd be with him midweek, and that Holmes and I would arrive late on Friday afternoon. The plan worked perfectly. Our train was on time at Great Paddock Station, and a pony and trap was waiting for us. I recognized the driver. It was Ben Crump, who worked for Sir Rodney Trimble. 
Afternoon, Dr. Watson. Afternoon, sir. You must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Hi, Ben. Ah, uh, thank you. It's nice to see you, Ben. But uh, why are you meeting us? You still working for Sir Rodney? Uh, that's right, but... Uh, well, the Reverend and your wife, they've both been out all day. So I was asked to take the trap and fetch you. There's no need to worry. I'll be home by the time you get there. <clears throat> are you comfortable, are you? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Thank you, Ben. Right, go on in, Bessie. Come on, up we go, up we go. Oh, this old <laughs> Yes, you'll find her way back to St. Anne's without anyone holding the reins. I know. Bessie's a great favourite of my brother-in-law's. Has it been a good year for you up at the hall, Ben? Times are hard, Dr. Watson. He's cut back a lot on entertaining. This weekend be the first time he's planned to shoot for nearly a year. Oh, planning a shoot over the weekend, is he? Tomorrow, the weather holds. I reckon you two gentlemen will be invited. You, uh, you like to shoot, Mr. Holmes? I'm considered quite a good shot, yes. Oh, one of the very best. What do you go for here? Pheasants? Woodcock? That's right. Now, there's plenty of them to be flushed out. Just hope when the beaters start, we can cut the birds off from heading to Great Fox Wood. Great Fox Wood? Ah, yes. That's where there was a murder some few months ago, is that right? No, that's right. We, uh, we don't talk about that round here, Mr. Holmes. Some things is best forgotten. If you want to be a friend to Sir Rodney and everyone else in these parts, well, uh, you won't ever mention it. You got my meaning? Oh, now it looks like rain clouds over there. Come on, Bess, let's get on with it. Get us home. Within half an hour, we were at the vicarage, and all thoughts of Ben Crumb's warning had faded from my mind. It was a wonderful reunion. Percy Phelps was warm and as welcome, and Mary radiant to be able to play hostess for him as she used to in the old days. Dinner was delicious, and we sat by a pine log fire afterwards, taking coffee and liqueurs. It was a most pleasant domestic seat. Ah, what could be more delightful than having one's family and dear friends gathered around one's own heart? Uh, I'm so happy to see you all. Oh, I do wish you the very best of health. May you enjoy being here this weekend as much as I shall enjoy having you. It's quite wonderful. I'm so pleased that you came with John, Mr. Holmes. I took very little persuading, I can assure you, Mary. The only thing that amazes me is that a whole year has passed since you were married. It seems but a few months. Oh, oh, oh. wait until you try marriage, Holmes. A year with the wrong person might seem like ten. <laughs> well, here's to the next ten years for you, John, and for you, Mary. Oh, thank you, dear. To a very happy couple. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, dear, now, who can that now, be? Now, don't you get up, Percy, dear. Let me go and answer the door. I shan't be a moment. You men stay where you are and enjoy your drink. <sighs> well, I must congratulate you, John. <laughs> You've made my sister the happiest woman in the world. I always thought she would become a contented woman, but I never believed that within a year she could change so much. Well, she looks and sounds years uh, younger. Well, I refuse to believe that I brought her more happiness than she's brought me. Well, I suppose we're just very lucky, that's all. Yes, 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 you are. And I hope and pray that luck continues. Well, I see no reason why it shouldn't. Percy, <laughs> look who's here. Huh? Sir Rodney, oh. who's just walked over from <laughs> the hall. Do come in, Sir Rodney. Thank you, my dear. Oh, Sir Rodney, what a lovely surprise. And you've arrived at just the right time. John Watson is here and also Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, as long as I'm not intruding upon a family reunion. Hello, Watson. So nice to see you. Yes. And, and of course, I, I've heard much about you, Mr. Holmes. Welcome to Nettlebed. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> sir. Nice well, we Do join us for coffee and a drink, will you, Sir Rodney? Oh, thank you. Thank you, but no, I, I can but stop a moment. I called to find out if your guests had arrived, Reverend, and if you'd all care to join us up at the hall in our first shoot of the season. I think we've heard you, Mr. Rodney. The old man Crump said something about it when he drove us up from the station. And I remember thinking, uh, well, very selfishly, that I hoped I'd get an invitation. <laughs> oh, good man. That means you'll accept it. <laughs> Only too willingly. And you, Holmes? How can I refuse? I shall look forward to it. Uh, it's no good asking me, of course, but... And Mary will, I'm sure, be delighted to join you all at the hall and act as hostess. She, she's extremely good at organizing things like refreshments. <laughs> Would you consent, Mary, Mary? I do confess that I am in need of such help, and I'd be very, very grateful. 
The servants will do all the preparations, of course, but I need someone to be with the field carriages to serve refreshments to the guests. Oh, well, of course, I'd love it. I have done a little of that sort of thing on other occasions, so I know I can manage it, and it means I'll be able to watch John and Mr. Holmes in action. Will there be many guests, and shall I know any of them? There are about a dozen, including yourselves, mostly local people, a few from town... Oh, the only one you might know is David Endicott. David? Uh, oh, how silly of me. I've spilt my wine. Uh, wh who did you say? David Endicott. Yes, I, um, I, I think I did meet him many years ago. I, I doubt if he'll remember me, though. Well, uh, well uh, I must be on my way. Uh, don't bother to see me out. I know the way. Uh, good night to all. I'll expect you up at the hall nice and early tomorrow morning. We want to start the first party to drive at about ten o'clock, so shall we say no later than 9.30? Good night to you all. Thank you Good so much. Good night, Good Sir Rodney. After Sir Rodney had left, the talk became general. But I noticed that Mary was very quiet. We retired early. And the moment that we were in our room, she gave a little sob and placed her arms around me. Oh, John. John, John. Mary, 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 my dear, what is it? Oh, John, I didn't think it would ever happen. You remember many years ago that that I told you I I was engaged to be married and and that the man walked out on me. I was jilted. Davis, that was years ago. What does that matter now? We're happily married. You put all that behind me. No, no, listen to me, please, dear. The man I was to have married... Is this man David Endicott? He will be at the shoot tomorrow, and, and John, I, I am so afraid, so very afraid. Afraid? You mean you, you're afraid of meeting this man from your past? Yes, I am. Afraid of, of what might happen. You think you, you might still feel attracted to him? Oh no, dear, no, nothing like that. No, it's. It's just that that I have found out so much more about him, and then, John, I'm convinced that he is evil. David Endicott is an evil man and can only bring tragedy to Nettlebed. I'm sure of it. I have never seen Mary so upset. Of course, she'd explained to me before we were married that she'd suffered an unhappy love affair years ago. But I'd never inquired the man's name or asked for any details. Now, we were to confront him the following day. I reassured my wife, told her that nothing could possibly go wrong. That she was to get a good night's sleep and it would all seem less formidable in the morning. But I was disturbed in my own mind. And I should have been even more so if I'd known what was going on at the hall that very evening. Ah, now that's better. Uh, David, uh, I think the time has come for us to have a little talk. Hmm? Yes, Sir Rodney, what is on your mind? Surely you don't mind me helping myself to a slight nightcap? Oh, no, not at all, uh. Although I, I think I should be honest and say that you seem to be drinking far more heavily than ever... It's no way out, you know. Uh, no way out from what? From the sort of dissipated life that you're leading, that you have led for so many years. Oh, dear. Am I going to end my first day here with a moral lecture? Uh, yes, uh, yes, if that is what you wish to call it. This is still my house, and I must ask you to respect the fact that I have many guests tomorrow. You are part of the weekend, and I hope you enjoy yourself. You're a good shot and should be very useful in the team. But please, I, I know what you're like on these occasions. You can no more keep your hands off a woman than you can the whiskey bottle. I won't stand for it tomorrow. Well, that sounds more like a threat than a lecture. Why don't you just ask me to leave right now? You know full well that I can't do that. Please, David, it's important. And there are lots of really nice people coming down. One of them is someone I think you used to know very well. Mary Phelps, the vicar's sister. She's now married to Dr. Watson, who is also a member of our party. Mary? Little Mary Phelps? 
Well, well, well. She is no longer little Mary Phelps. She's Mrs. John Watson, and she's a grown woman. Mature, sensible, and very happy. Just make sure that you don't cause trouble, David. If you do, in any way, then I shall no longer protect you or give you further warnings. I shall kill you. Morning dawned bright and clear, but with a sharp wind. Mary and I were up early. She seemed pale and tense, but quite determined to go through with the day as it had been planned. Reverend Phelps had been called out during the night to sit with a sick person in the neighboring village. And of Sherlock Holmes, there was no sign. We were having coffee in the morning room when he marched in from the garden, fully dressed and flushed from a brisk walk. Ah, coffee, what a splendid idea. Good morning, Watson. Morning, Mary. Good morning. A black with two sugars. Yes, very well. I'll pour it for you. Come and sit down. Uh, morning, Holmes. You're up and about early. I thought it as well to take a look at the lie of the land before embarking on any practical shooting. Sir Rodney has his drives all marked out, and the beaters are gathered in force. Mm, sounds very promising. Yes, yes, it does. The only trouble is the wind. From what I can make out of the planned shoot, the first drive should flush the birds out from over the land known as Barnes Bridge and the Low Meadows. If the wind freshens more than it is, then the birds will be taken over the farm and into Great Fox Wood. Great Fox Wood? That's right. I understand that no one likes to talk about that wood and what happened there some seven months ago. No, no, it was horrible. Even Percy refuses to discuss it. No one ever goes in there these days. And you don't know why? No, no one does. It's a forbidden subject, you see. Something no one talks about. Oh, yes, they do, amongst themselves. During my early morning walk, I came across the man Ben Crump. He's acting head marker, placing sticks with names on them where he wants the guns to be standing. I greeted him, and he didn't seem at all pleased to see me. Well, <clears throat> morning, Mr. Holmes. What were you doing down here at this hour? Oh, just finding my bearings. I see you're placing the guns. That's it. Anxious to keep the partridge out of Great Foxwood? Why? Because the beaters will refuse to go in there? They think it's evil? How did you come to know that? Oh, rumors spread very quickly in the country, as you know. Have you any theories of your own, then? I just do my job. So, I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Holmes. These beaters are fine men, but you won't get any of them in that wood. Not even in daylight. Because that's where the murder took place? Not just that. They say, they say it's haunted. That that man, Arthur Perriman, who strangled his wife because she was unfaithful to him, he, he hanged himself in there. And they can see his body rotten from a tree. They seriously believe this. Oh, I, not only that, it, it, his spirit comes back and haunts the wood. I don't reckon I believe it myself. I knew Perryman. He's a violent man, wild, jealous. The folks around here swear they've seen his ghost. Now, so that's how the matter stands. We just got to do our best to see that the birds don't take us into Great Fox Wood. It's the wind that's the trouble. It's the wind. So, it seems we're in for a very interesting morning, doesn't it, Watson? Very interesting. Well, I do believe this is the real reason why I accepted the invitation to this weekend. Now, really, it's too bad of you, Holmes. Why can't you leave things alone and not turn a pleasant day's outing into a criminal investigation? I suppose because it's my job, Watson. Are you ready to go? I was annoyed with Holmes. I'd suspected all along that he was far more interested in the unsolved murder than he was in celebrating my wedding anniversary. I was also worried about Mary and this man David Endicott. I wondered what they would think of each other. But when they met, everything seemed perfectly normal. David, uh, you must meet Dr. Watson and his wife. Uh, you remember Mary? Oh, of course I do. How could I forget her? Hello, Mary. How wonderful to see you again after all these years. And your husband. Very pleased to meet you, Dr. Watson. Congratulations. I can see you've made Mary a very happy woman. Thank you. I'm pleased to meet you also. You're looking well, David. I hope you are happy also. Oh, very. Watson, can I show you the shooting positions? Ben has them marked out this way. Come along, David. Coming, Sir Rodney. I hope we can meet again later, Mary. I have such a lot to tell you. You're looking quite lovely. Oh, I've been such a fool. I made my biggest mistake over you. I shall be in touch. David! Coming! Goodbye, Mary, my dear. Sir Rodney called us all to order. The party was divided up, and we set out for the first drive. I found myself in a gun position next to Holmes, with David Endicott on the far side. 
The beaters began work, and suddenly the wind freshened. Almost at once, the partridge began to leave cover and fly straight overhead. Whistles shrilled. The birds came on. They were easy targets. But to my sheer surprise, Holmes hardly produced a shot. And when he did, it was as though he deliberately aimed wild. The whole covey got through and heading over the farm, settled gently in Great Foxwood. Holmes! Holmes, what the devil is the matter with you? You and Watson have let them all through! They're in Great Fox! Come on, men! We we'll beat them out! The men won't go in there, sir, are they? Damn it, they'll have to go in there! We need them ourselves! Come on, men! Come on! Follow me! There was no time for more talk. We all felt pretty guilty at this failure, and I was determined to see that it didn't occur again, even if I had to drop Holmes' birds myself. But once we landed in the woods, we found it more difficult than we'd thought. Every possible tree seemed to have been planted there. The place was overgrown, and one could scarcely get through the jungle-like foliage. I found myself with Endicott and Holmes, with Sir Rodney to our left shouting orders. Forward! Forward! Men! There's one left! Holmes, Holmes, you run. Yes, yes. Take a grip on your gun, Watson, and make sure it's fully loaded. Come on. We may well have to use it soon. Oh, yeah. Look, there is a clearing. There. Stop. Now, 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 wait a moment. Oh, come on, men! Come on! Wait a little, Stop him! Stop him! It's coming! The thing's coming! Watch out! Oh, great! Evans, what is it? It's like a wild dog! Watch out! Keep away! Run! It's the only thing! Creature, Sir Rodney, is Arthur Perryman, the man who seven months ago strangled his wife in these woods and then went mad and has been living here almost as an animal ever since. Poor devil. It's just as well that it's all over for him. And as for David Endicott, well, you'd better see what you can do for him, haven't you, Watson? I knelt beside the still form of David Endicott in the depths of Great Foxwood. I had to tear Perryman's hands away from him. Endicott was badly savaged about the face and throat. Of course, the whole shoot was called off. The guests departed with as much dignity as they could muster, and the police were called in. It wasn't until we were all safely back in the vicarage and Percy Phelps was dispensing stiff drinks that Holmes was able to complete his summing up. I'm sorry that the weekend started so badly, but I'm sure it was most necessary to solve the problem. You see, I checked most thoroughly in London before we came down here on the Perryman murder. I was sure that the police were quite wrong in thinking that Arthur Perryman had managed to escape after killing his wife. He hadn't left the country, yet no one had picked up a hint about him for over seven months. There was a rumour of a ghost in the woods. Could it be that Perryman was still there? There is a disused hut in the clearing. He'd lived there, crazed and wild. It was necessary to bring matters to a head. Of course, when he recognised David Endicott, his murderous intent flooded back. For it was Endicott who was his late wife's lover, the cause of his breakdown. It was Endicott who had a hold over Sir Rodney and was sponging off him, bleeding him white. And it is Endicott who now lies very ill in Great Paddock Hospital. I think that justice has been done. And perhaps many doubts removed from everyone's mind. Don't you agree, Watson? Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson.